seeing um, some of your some of your questions following Jeff's presentation. So you know, please do um, please do join in from that perspective. And um, I'll hand over to Jeff. So so Jeff, thank you very much. Over to you. Oh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Jeff Mannion. I, I originally came into health and safety back in the late eighties when in BBC had Legionella hit in London, and so I started this onward journey. I originally started in 1991 as an independent and have gathered knowledge and experience over the years. Um, you'll see a few things. I was one of the original chartered members of IOSH. I used to be one of their on a list of consultants. I've done a number of legal works with uh, criminal law and civil law. Um, I've done several consultations with HSE, the Legionella one, CDM, current one, the previous one. I chaired for a while the uh, IOSH construction group. But I'm here tonight to talk about basically risk assessment and I, I have issues. But first of all, I want to say the Berthia Health and Safety Regulations was a long while ago, a hell of a long time ago. And people don't realise, they think it's all very new, but there was this particular apprentices and other employees requirements back in the 80s, 1880s. But there, prior to that, if you go to uh, the Louvre in Paris, there's this two meter high stone tablet, which is around about 1750 BC, which is, includes a comment, if a builder has built a house and a man is, and his work is not strong, and the house is built is not strong, and the house he builds falls in and kills the householder, the builder shall be slain. I know we've moved away from this, and there's all sorts of consequences and actions and procedures for foul ups nowadays. In some cases, we haven't gone far enough. And this information here is I've taken from recent information that's come from the HSE, which suggests on one side that we're not doing enough. Um, we talk about 1.6 million people working who are suffering from work-related ill health. Two and a half thousand people have died, have died in 2018 as a past exposure to asbestos. It was 111 people who got up, didn't go home. They were killed at work. There's all these numbers and these numbers and these numbers, and this is where we need to sometimes think about what we're doing and how we're going to do it. The big one for me is this 16.2 billion pound estimated cost from the HSC for injuries and ill health. That's all the sort of collection of things behind the systems of when someone's injured. And this takes into account the NHS and the hospital things. And 16.2 billion in one annual period is one hell of a lot of money wasted. We need to do better. We can do better. Our problem is, with risk assessment, I think we're losing it. The risk assessments have been around for a long while. Um, it was part of our original goal-getting requirements from being part of EU. What was We've now left most of it, and there's some still some bits and pieces left around. It's been around for many years. There's this uh, failure of modes and effects analysis. The hazards and the hazards using only key terminology and phrasing, um, so it's been there for for a long while. I have been involved in a number of hazard studies over the years, particularly on on some sort of engineering projects where we have to show something that's happening and as a consequence. And what we're doing is basically reducing risk, reducing risk, reducing risk prior to the initial install of a system, and then come up with a system in place that says it's good to go. But once those done, we still need to carry out certain assessments for some of that work. This is obvious, isn't it? Risk assessment. We identify the hazard, the hazard with the potential to cause harm. Or hazardous substance with the potential to cause harm or give ill health. We need to think about who it can harm and evaluating the associated risk. I put in low, medium, and high. I've got a problem with that. I've got a real problem with that because I, I not ignore those. We need to control the risk by doing something. Sometimes it's doing something good, sometimes it's debatable. I feel there's still too much damn paperwork. The paperwork is there, but we're over -egging it. In the last week, I've come across an electrician and they sent me the paperwork that he was doing for a particular job. His job 
involves electrical wiring of a new build. They're not doing the major heavy voltage cables, they're doing all the associated cables. And I was given their risk assessment, which took 64 pages long. Now these 64 pages is gonna give the guys who turn up to work backache lifting the paperwork up. And it's printed off so someone sees it. And all these electricians come to site and they have to read this. And they're told, yeah, you've got to read this, you've got to do this, you've got to sign this. The problem is, that they sit there for a while and they get bored. They get bored because in, in reality, they know what they're doing. You have a hierarchy within the electrical trade, someone who's more, more involved with the actual commissioning and test. So the paperwork doesn't help. What it does, the guys who are doing it say, yeah, I'll sign here. And when they walk away, they're basically sticking their nose up at the paperwork and saying health and safety, health and safety has gone bad. That's why we're going wrong in many places. I put this one up, I've picked this up from the internet. This, uh, please do not enter the dangerous area beyond this gate, you will quite possibly get hurt. Then you'll sue, then a protracted court battle will ensure exhausting your financial resources and you lose because this science won't be, a, be there. Part of managing the health and safety of your business, you must control the risks in your workplace. I emphasize the must. Um, how you control the risks in your workplace is determined by you. Many of these pieces of legislation come around and say how you must do, but it's basically the same principle all the way through. To do this, we, might, we need to think about what might cause harm to people and decide whether you're taking reasonable steps. The reasonable steps is getting beyond the joke now for me. I'm finding that I'm seeing stuff of recent in the last 12 months where people are carrying out risk assessments for changing inks on printers. They've carried out risk assessment for using a microwave. I don't think this is reasonable. I think this is unreasonable. Again, what it does is some of the people who are experiencing this in the workplace basically turn their nose against health and safety and we become the laugh and stop. It's not correct, it's not right and it's not proper. We need to be sensible and proportionate. How do we become sensible and proportionate? I don't know, I haven't got all the answers. But to show something, so to show the world that we've done something to help the system, we have to provide evidence. This evidence is recorded. We all know about the five, five working people. This, um, comes into the significant risks. The management of health and safety work regulations, it's there. The majority of us should be aware of this and know what has happened. We know where there's five or more, we need to record it. We need to record the significant findings. If I go back to many of these, these things I'm seeing nowadays, they're not recording the significant findings, they're recording every single thing. They're recording everything because someone said, you have to, you have to, you have to. Again, it builds up the paperwork. It built up the paperwork into such a way that we get away from where we're trying to be. We get away from trying to give the information to the guys and the girls who are trying to do the functions, do the work. We get away and we're turning away from the health and safety bit. We need to go back to the basics saying, this is the things that's going to happen. These are the things that can harm you and this is how we're going to manage it. We do need to share that information. If it's in construction, we might need to share with other contractors. If we want to share with contractors above us, or alongside us, or around us. Um, but if you look into the CDM regulations, they talk about the particular areas. There's the falls from height, falls into transport, chemical, etc. These are all can be found under the CDM regulations, regulation three. And these are the big stuff that the HSC recognise there are issues. These are the ones that we need to focus more on. Having identified the hazards, we need to decide how likely its harm will occur, the level of risk and what to do about it. Risk is a part of everyday life. Risk is a part of everyday life. And we will have accidents. Accidents will happen all the time. These are not unusual occurrences, accidents. Every day, something's gonna happen. My way of thinking is to get rid of the big stuff, to bring it back down to the basic stuff. Yes, you might have a cut finger here. Yes, you might get dirt under your fingernails. Yes, you might not go home in the same way. You've got dirty, you've got unclean. But there are things in place you can wash up. 
we cannot get rid of all the risks. We cannot get rid of all these things. We need to talk about the main the significant ones and talk to people and explain to people, not dictate. This is where I've come into my next phase of this. I meet many health and safety people who come screaming and shouting and sometimes effing and blinding at people, saying, no, if you can't do this, you can't do this because the health and safety law says this. I often will challenge some of these safety people into why they're saying it. Because a lot of these things aren't prescriptive. They're not written down in statute law. They're not written down all over the place. But we need to have an approach that when we're talking to guys and girls who perhaps are not doing the right stuff and chat to them, communicate, offer advice and support. Not say you just can't do it. Try to work with them, posing the question with them. How can we help you? And sometimes it takes thinking outside the box. It takes thinking to do it in a different way. It's helping them manage their risks, helping them oversee what they need to do. You see this on the screen now, the typical risk matrix. I hate these with passion. Um, top is a free by free, and you can see the numbers there. It's in teaching, it's shown through many systems and the way this is up. In reality, I feel they offer no extra benefit. What happens if they go nice and flashy on paperwork and documents and colours? It looks good, it looks wonderful when they're produced by people who perhaps have some knowledge. But when you have multiples of these and you're showing to people who are trying to do the work, it takes away the core message. It gets away from what's called the significant hazard. On the right hand side, I've seen the five by five. Of recent, in the last 12 months, I've seen a system with six by six, there's 36 categories, which really expands on this more. Then you have to try to explain to the guys and the girls what this all means and how they can deal with it. It means more input, more to, more to them, talking to them to explain it. But just to add to this, only this week I've received some documentation that has a seven by seven grid, a 49 step system. It's, I, I think it's unachievable. I just do not think it's right and proper. And when you look at these the tables, it just expands the stuff. What we need to do is get back to basics. The hazard, the potential to cause harm, who it's gonna hurt, control measure. The control measure is the is this way forward. The control measure is how we operate safely. Yes, we can talk about safe systems work. Yes, we can talk about method statements, but when it boils down to the end of the day, are we doing enough and are we passing enough information back to our workforce? The risk assessment is not about creating huge amounts of paperwork. It's not about creating that. I mentioned the 64 pages for the electricians. It's crazy. I want to explain another one. I'm working on a project at the moment where there's a fire alarm being installed. It's a building, it's a residential building, and it's a wireless system. Part of what I've helped out with is to use a wireless system rather than putting holes in the building, which you have to do fire stopping, etc. And they have somewhere about 100 pages of documents for the guys who are fit, fitting the job out, and there's four gents on site who are doing this. And the paperwork has to be read and has to be signed all them because their boss says so, and their safety manager says so, and this person said so. It's beyond the joke. And particularly when you're talking to the guys who are, many of them are time surf electricians. We do have some apprentices there on site at the moment, but it's getting away from the core message. The Management Health and Safety Work Regulations, as amended, do not refer to low, medium or high or risk tables or quantification same. We need to talk about the hazard, the potential to cause harm, who can be hurt and the control measures. All this wasted time and effort, talk about low, medium, high, is irrelevant. It becomes such a silly thing for me that all I want to focus is on is what your control measures are. What your control measures are and are they being adopted and are they being managed? Generally, risk assessment is not found in the work at high regulation. It talks about the avoid, talks about the work equipment, talks about the schedules. It talks about the avoidance of risk from high, 
not risk assessment. The lifting operation, lifting equipment regulations, the same. Provision and use of work equipment regulations, pure. Due to the general risk assessment requirements in the management regulations, which is your risk assessment, there is no specific regulation requiring a risk assessment in pure. I'm constantly being asked to, can you talk about a risk assessment for hand drills? They're built with all the sort of bits and pieces in place. Perhaps someone needs some information, instructions and training to carry out the function to use the equipment. The brace of wheels is, is the one that we hear about. So carrying out a risk assessment for pure needs to be limited. You're producing more paperwork to achieve the same end. And I know that if you go back into the original APOC, it talks about the knives, etc., for uh, operating theatres and surgeons, but we've must have moved away from that for now. The work at high regulations, the lifting operation, lifting equipment regulations, provision use of work equipment regulations are all defined regulations. So when you start to look into them, it tells you what you have to do. It tells you there how to do this. It tells you how to manage risk. It's got the information there. Particularly the work at high regulations, it talks about, in effect, a top part of a handrail for be it construction or the workplace. It's there. It tells you. You can't get away from it. So why do we need to carry out another risk assessment? Yes, you carry out all the potential to say, we will use this system rather than that system for carrying out work at high. These are defined regulations, so we don't have to do much. Again, electricity at work regulations, there's reference to what's called reasonably practicable. The more you get involved with health and safety, you'll understand what the reasonably practicable tab is. You'll see it all the time. So there, again, under electricity, it's defined, and there's a lot of definitions within electricity at work regulations and how you can do it, which might include uh, specialist advice. The construction design and management regulations. Regulation 15.9c refers to a contract providing information identified by risk assessment. That's the only part of it that has it there. These are still are the defined regulations. You don't want to get me started on design and risk assessments because I find them very laborious. Again, lots of numbers, lots of things. What they should be doing, in my view, is with a design and risk assessment, and I hate that term, design and risk assessment, they should be talking about hazard information, hazard at the end of it rather than a control measure, handing it over to a contractor to carry out that work. It's not unreasonable, it's sensible, it's sensible thinking. Again, going into the cost regulations, there are no risk tables. We're using the, the term so far as it's reasonably practical. Again, we're not using risk tables. And if you look at how cost assessments are being carried out, it says control measures. It gives the control measures. You've got no quantifications of anything. So that's why it backs up my reasoning behind risk assessment and why we're doing it wrong. Fair risk avoidance is a way of dealing with things and sometimes the risk avoidance could be by using a specialist contractor to do something. It's a way of doing something to stop doing something another way but sometimes replacing these hazardous chemicals by one with less or no risk potential has another knock-on effect. Some of these things become a problem because we're reducing some chemicals, some agents for cleaning that may not be able to effectively clean or clear the product or problem in the first place. So what we're doing is we're taking one away and using another one with less control. One I find particularly is the, is the one that we talk about in terms of chlorine or bleach, bleaching, sodium hypochlorate, all these chemical names. It's a good product. It's a product that we've been using for years. It's very effective. It's not that bad to man. Yes, it can be. We don't want to drink it. We don't want to eat it. But removing the hazardous chemicals, such as the chlorine, down to something with a lower level of chlorine or sodium hypochlorate may not do what we need to do. Risk retentions are, are often financed by the company, but these are more into local authorities. I don't want to go too much about it. We can do this risk transfer where we, we transfer one loss to another buy insurance and we need to be aware that some of our insurance companies particularly at the moment in the last few months and particularly over the last two years have been looking at some of these things and how we are managing some of these risks they look at it as a risk transfer rather than risk assessment 
some of the insurance is, is starting to rise based on the fact that we're not doing enough. Risk reduction, control measures. Again, hierarchy of risk controls, similar to what we talked about earlier. But if we're giving risk reduction, surely training information instruction can help this. If we're giving the right information instruction and training to people, we are reducing our risk, which means we raise the level of competence within our workforce, whichever working operation you're in. So training information instruction. Not long, long, drawn out systems, but basic, straightforward, in your face, done, dealt with. It's sharing information, proportion at the right time in the right way. But providing training that sometimes has limitations in terms of when people get bored, sleepy, tired of someone laboring on about something. Controlling risk at the moment, we're using legislation to reduce risk to a level that is low as reasonably practical, sometimes abbreviated as LR, particularly it comes up in the cost regulations. It's this means that we carry out, we look at the degree of risk on one side, balance against the time, trouble, cost. But what happens when we do these things and we change things? What happens? Do we introduce a new risk? Do we introduce a new hazard? Do we introduce a new outcome? And I'm seeing many of these things where on these risk assessments with these numbers, they've got all these things in place, but they're not looking at the significant stuff. They're going back and they say, no, if you do this, do this. Just a quick flow chart, nothing special. It's similar to lots of things in risk reduction, risk management and their processes. And particularly with the link into IRSM, which is risk. We're looking at risk management in all sorts of ways. It's a similar key thing. But all risk assessments can be flawed by asking the question, what if? And I've sat in many meetings where I'm being asked, what if, what if, what if? We can't keep saying, what if, what if, what if? We need to have a, a standing point and say, no, that's enough. That's what a low is reasonably practical it could be. Or it could be that we take that risk on. But if we take that risk on, we give enough information, instruction and training to the people at the end of the line. It is risk assessment. Is it really a straightforward process based on a personal judgment? It shouldn't involve specialist skills or complicated techniques unless it happens to be something that's beyond the competence or perhaps the knowledge of the individuals. But we need to share this information with the guys and the girls who are under the job who are doing this job. They're the ones who have been exposed to risks, hazards, not me, but necessarily people who are listening in the audience this moment. This is approach is commonly known as a qualitative or subjective. Now, my risk considerations are likely to be different to someone else's. And that's this what if. And if we keep saying what if and we don't have some sort of stand in measure, some sort of risk profile or risk thought, we're going to go too far still. The Plan, Do, Check Act, I've quickly put it up on the screen. It's, it's a way, it's a useful way of going forward for the future. Um, I quite admire the system and it links into the ISOs, and quality assurance, etc. So determining policy, planning for implementation, the Do, Check Act. I'm not going to labour on about that because these are av readily available. Readily available for all to see and find. So I'm just putting something on my phone because it's hitting there. A, a routine violation for human factors is behaviour in opposition to the rules. Cutting corners. And what's happening is these are the things I find as where people who we're trying to talk about risk assessment are ignoring. When you see these signs saying do not walk across the grass, isn't that a control measure? And then you see people walking across the grass and doing things. We need to give the right information. We don't want the rules to be seen to be over restrictive, overbearing. We need to give the right information to the right people at the right time. That's been followed in previous pieces of legislation, right information to the right people at the right time. 
we need them on board to help us. We need them on board to under see what, understand and see why we're talking about this. We need buying from the people at work. Some of these people, some of the guys and the girls out there, just turning themselves off and away from us. I was on a job this morning where they're producing massive amounts of paperwork for this, and they were complaining to me. I was doing an audit. Um, they were complaining to me about the amount of paperwork, and the amount of paperwork is there. Why? I can't explain to them. I'm just saying it's a side rule, it's an operational rule. But someone needs to challenge these people. Some of these, because what's happening on this site, there's a number of incidents occurring, and people are saying, Why are they? They're saying they're, they're following, they're not following the rules, not following this, not following that. But because there's so many rules written into the risk assessment, written into the documents, written into the procedures, people are taking shortcuts. If they continue to take shortcuts, perhaps the injuries are going to get greater, not minor, and it's not the be all and end all of this. We need to talk about people, we need to reduce the paperwork, we need to reduce the unnecessary rules. We need to get to a basic system where we can say, this is what you have to do, this is how you can do it. And not dropping a whole pile of paperwork in front of someone to be able to say, you must adopt this. Because as they're walking away, putting their fingers up in the air, at the paperwork, and they're taking a violation. They're not following what they need to do. Then that leads to incident. Um, and I, I'm very aware of that. And just in the last week, a man was using an angle grinder. He was too busy thinking about other stuff and it crawled up his arm into his face and he's got 80 stitches in his face because he couldn't be asked. He couldn't be bothered with all the paperwork or reading the paperwork. The common faults of risk assessment, though, are the wrong hazards. Identifying all hazards associated with an activity, using generic when specific would be better. We should be sitting back in the office saying, these are the key things, these are the significant risks, these are the things that are going to happen. We should be able to quantify those and bold them down to a set of generic headings, a number of headings we can do. It may be that when we get to the working environment, wherever that may be, it could be on your shop floor, it could be a construction site, it could be an airport giving them the right information at the right time for the daily tasks, chatting to people, and then enhancing them with the local environment where we're at. We talk about the wrong people. We're not considering some people who would be exposed to the risks. There may be a team of five people, but four people may not be doing the same thing. As an example, we may have a man who's working and sitting in an excavator, moving the excavator while others might be, in it, be exposed to the external side of the ex excavator. But everyone has to see the same thing. Yes, the man may be competent or incompetent driving the machine, but how much does he take on board? It's got to be considered. So it's sometimes the wrong people, the wrong hazards given to the wrong people. Underestimating risks, routine operations rather than maintenance. Now maintenance is a big tag to it and maintenance is all sorts of ways that's cleaning and maintenance being on a building or perhaps maintenance of machinery or plant underestimating risk by ignoring the material safety data sheets not looking at it particularly now that we have this thing called reach in place and there's chemical information which is better readily available and under mess underestimating risk by not looking at the all health records Go back to the original screen, we've shown how many people have been made unwell at work. And we're not looking at it, we're not thinking about it. Overestimating control measures by putting too many things in. I talk about the human factors there, but also the, the misuse of the equipment, the misuse of stuff, the failure to effectively control. Basically, not talking to people. Inappropriate mythology. Detailed, quantified risk assessments for me are not the way forward. They're not the way forward because there's too many numbers. It looks nice, it looks fancy, it's all color coded. The seven by seven grids, I mean, it's outrageous. Three by three, I, I still don't like them. But then we're trying to, dis, to justify the decision making process. We're trying to justify why we're doing this. We fail to consult with a specialist. Perhaps someone like me, perhaps someone who perhaps who works in asbestos or a, 
nuclear plant. We need people to be more competent. That's not just people who are in the health and safety world, but it's people who are actually doing the jobs. And if you take an example, electricians, generally electrical test engineer would be more competent than a sparky electrician putting in cables, pulling cables. But we need to work with the guys and the girls who do the job. We need to talk through these things and we need to talk from them and we need feedback from them. And yes, we need to take it on the chin when they're criticising us. Yes, we need to help them go through this. We need to work with them. I still think there's still too much damn paperwork. The paperwork has to be there, but the amount of paperwork that's being generated nowadays is just too much. We need to be sensible. Common faults for risk assessment, not linking the hazards with controls. Now, that can include PPE, and I'm sure you're all aware that PPE is the last resort. But if you go into a construction site, what do they do? Give you all the PPE. As a buyer of that, when you go to the health and safety exhibitions, what do they sell you there? PPE. We're putting, sometimes we're putting effort into the lower hazards and not focusing on the significant hazards. We need to sort of back down on those. We need to make sure that that's appropriate to the working tasks. We're not recording appropriately. We're not giving enough information to the guys and the girls who are doing the job, hence the 63 pages of risk assessments. We need people to understand why we're doing this. Yes, we might talk about the numbers of people who have ill health, who are hurt, exposed to asbestos, who die as a result of that previous exposure. But we need to work with them. We need to help them find a way forward. Common faults failure to implement the findings. Again, is that because the guys and the girls are just sticking their fingers up at what we've tried to provide? Monitoring, when things happen, are we doing enough to say this is going wrong? Are we checking to see what's occurring? There's a, generally there's a failure to review when work changes and we only tend to have the work after instance, after real health. It's more after an instance, something's occurred. But of course, if there's not enough mere misreporting, we don't get to know. Still, I say, come and follow risk assessment. It's too much damn paperwork. There are many common hazards in to all industries. A lot of the industries have common, common hazards. There are changes in the work environment, the weather, the exposures to the weather. And this weekend, we're looking at some pretty rough weather around the country. Changes the environment, working at high. Today, I saw a mobile elevated work platform on a balcony, seven stories up, on a book, on a building, it was lifted in by a tower crane, and this thing happened to be raised to possibly its full height. Wow, that's a bit dodgy for me. Others working nearby, they're often forgotten, but we should be talking to people, particularly on a construction site, when forming part of the induction process. I still think there's still too much damn paperwork. Risk assessments, conclusion. Not every single hazard needs to be there. The tag suitable and sufficient comes up through the HSE, Health and Safety Executive. Significant risks first, trivial risks and normally can be ignored. Risk based risk, waste of energy. I'm going to say that in particular now. If you look at the Health and Safety Executive, you look on their web pages, you look at the generic risk assessments they put in there for a few industries, they don't talk about low, medium, high. They don't talk about numbers. When it all goes wrong, it boils down to what did you do, what were your measures? They look at the end column. We need to think about the hazard, the potential to cause harm. We need to think about the control measures, the good way of doing stuff. We need to be about recording. Are we working with people? Are we giving enough information? Are they buying in into what we're talking about? Are we monitoring? Are we looking? Are we sharing information? And when we're sharing information, can we do something, share that with, with others? Is it the end of risk assessment? Who's know it? I don't like the numbers. I've already said that. I hate the numbers and I do not like the low, medium, high, and all these numbers. We need to get the teams involved. It's not just a health and safety manager or risk manager's function or the supervisor's function. It's all of us. We're in it to look after people. Hopefully you can see this screen and I pose the question, is it safe? 
I have a wry sense of humour. Don't shoot the messenger. It's not good health and safety. Greg, you can take over. Hopefully I should, should be back. Hello, everybody. Here I am. A um, uh, couple, couple of questions that have come through, um, Jeff. One, one is in relation to more common than anything else. Is it, is it saying that um, one, one of the major failures is that risk assessment is seen too often as the end of the process, not the start of the process, i.e. once we've got a risk assessment, we're good to go, rather than actually looking at what it's telling you about what you need to do? Yes, I often see it as the end process. Health and safety is not just risk assessment. Risk assessment is only one part of it. Information, instruction, training, all those little things is part of it. Yes, they've, the majority of people see the risk assessment as the be all and end all. It's not. It's not, it, it, it is part. And and, and the second one that's, that's, that's come through in relation to asbestos, um, is saying that you know as, as as far as a risk assessment for from an asbestos perspective actually is a it, it is a quantitative risk assessment isn't it where you you've got scores for material assessment and priority assessment and and is it a matter of it being horses for courses in terms of whether you enumerate or whether you narrative uh, okay so the um the number game with the asbestos come up through Gene Prentice through Macron Laboratories in the 2006 edition of the regulations. And I think that was a useful tool. The useful tool because prior to then, the, the, you saw a survey that was all over the place. You went to another location, it was all over the place, and you couldn't have something. I think it's been well defined within there, and I think it's very useful. Um, it's actually very useful, but I still, it's, it's good for carrying out the survey work and the ongoing stuff because it gives a level playing field across the country but you need to be able to read what that says and understand what that says agreed okay thank you for that and and i, I have one more again please if you do have any questions um from jeff's presentation today please do enter them into the chat box um it, it is there on the right hand side um and we will field those um one person agreeing with you with regards to um sometimes looking at the wrong people and the comments there's been made from the the initial you you had 111 up i think it it, it was that the 2020 figure isn't it? it's usually about 140 people per annum um go to work in the morning and, and don't come home um but it says if you break that down onto a sector analysis obviously you've got construction manufacturing service waste and recycling it says but each of those is beaten almost every year by members of the public and it's often they get forgotten um, as being a, a factor in risk assessments. I think I think for the last year off the top of my head, it was about 92 members of the public were killed in, in work related or, or workplace workplace injury as part of workplace injuries. Yeah, well, the, the problem with that is what, what we have is we have mum and dad taking kids to school. They're on the road certain times a day. You have trucks coming past and a truck can have some sort of occurrence and we they don't have to report it under the health and safety under RIDOC. I believe uh, I'm right in saying there's possibly five persons a day who are seriously injured or die as a result of an RTA, a road traffic accident, and it's not recorded in the same way. There has been some suggestion that they would like to, as the authorities like to include in that, but of course the buggeration factor has been in the last uh, 20 months or so is this COVID thing, which has really shown another angle. Don't get me started really? on that one. Oh, <laughs> sorry. No, no, no. Please carry on. I didn't want well, to interrupt. Well, well, I've seen, I've seen that fairly recently that you have to report COVID under RIDOC, which is completely wrong. Um, you, if you're not working with COVID, you do not report under RIDOC. There's some nuances there, but uh, it frustrates me. If it's frustrating me, all these things, particularly with risk assessment, I feel it's frustrating the guys and the girls who have been given the information and going, oh my goodness, this is crazy. Health and safety gone mad. We can't get away from that. We need sensible, proportionate information. Yeah, and, and, and the, the, well, one, one more, the last one I've got here is, is, is written communication is the, is the key, but the, the right communication. 
very much so. The right communication. Um, you, you'll see a couple of the, the, my little screenshot of the man standing on the safe. I will often introduce some sort of humorous thing. I must admit that health and safety is quite a dull, boring subject. Um, I've sat in many lectures going back into the late 80s, all the way from originally starting with the cost regulations. Um, I, I, I tend to be more vocal and I, I tend to be the joker of the pack and say things. And, and a lot of people have, have, heard, have said to me after I've done some presentations, not, not this one this evening, is they can remember the funny bits. And actually with that tags with the funny bits, that communication has gone to, to guys and girls. And they said, I remember that bit. And it helps. We need to communicate better. We're not dictators in health and safety, but there are dictators in health and safety. Brilliant. Thank, thank you for that, Jeff. I'm, I'm hoping Julie's still here. I think some, some questions have come through on Julie's feed. So um, if Julie could come back, we may have one or two more conscious at the time and we we can take them. So I'm hoping okay. you're there, Julie. <clears throat> yes, we've got what do we do when clients when clients risk assessments get rejected by main contractors who want more content? I, I, I haven't got a great answer. Um, again, for the experience, I was on a job only recently, last week, where risk assessments have been issued to a contractor on a project. And the contractor has come back and said, you need to beef it up, you need to put more in it. This is crazy. But what it does suggest to me is the lack of, it, lack of competence of the people who are upstream who are looking at this. We should be having contractors perhaps accept not um, having some sort of process that we are aware of in, in advance. So the talk should be prior to submitting the documentation to the contractor. What do you want from us? What do you want to see in here? And if there was a checklist, at least you are half the way there. But you will find that, you, I've experienced it many times, um, when I was working on projects a couple of years ago, they wanted to put the tables in on risk assessments. So we had to make it bigger just to satisfy someone who'd been on a course. I haven't got a good answer for you there. Great. Well, so there's one more here. Without a written plan, how is the hazard slash risk reduction conducted and how is that shown that it is in place brief when things go wrong? Ah, it's that's a that's a that's a one. If we go back to basics and if you can imagine you sat in your office and you've got a little spreadsheet and you could write all the hazards that are going to apply to your particular thing, at least you've started off with something. You're then moving on, and then this, if you're reducing those hazards or the potential impacts, you can only just document it for a period of time. And if you're updating it, it's, spreadsheets are great, particularly if you put in the right box for date and time you did something to say this is what you did on that date, you are moving forward. But sharing the relevant information at the right time has got to be key to this, not giving the whole pack of everything to everyone, the right information. Great. Then we've just got one more. Given that there are similar workplaces and industries worldwide with varying cultures, would you agree that there needs to be a global approach to risk management? I can't see the rest of the question. Okay. Risk management. Right. What role would organisations like RRISM and ILO play in crafting this global? And then I can't see the rest. Apologies. Okay, well, I, 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 I do hold some American qualifications, the AWSE, um, because I was doing some work or potential work in the Caribbean. It's a story, not for now. America have a system in place with something like the Risk Assessment Institute, and they use all these numbers. That's how they do it. But they've only started to do that in the last three to five years, and there's, there's all sorts of training there. I don't think we can get to a global conclusion. And part of it is the way we do things here in the United Kingdom is different how they do it in Europe, it's different how they do it in America, the Northern Americas compared to the Southern Americas, compared to the Indian subcontinents. I do not think we have the way forward to do that. I think we could within the sort of systems of the ISO quality standards potential because it's linked into there. But if you look at the amount of ISO registered organisations who hold that qualification and certification. It isn't big compared to the world number of businesses out there. It's a way, way ahead. It's not going to be there for way beyond my lifetime. 
Okay, I think that's all we've got time for tonight, but lots of comments about how they agree with what you're saying, excellent seminar. So on that note, I'd just like to thank you for your excellent presentation and to let everyone know that the webinar has been recorded and will be on the YouTube channel. And I'll hand over to Greg for closing comments. Brilliant, thank you very much indeed, Julie. And again, yeah, thank you, Jeff, for a, a very thought-provoking uh, presentation on the Thursday evening. I'd like to thank all those that have attended this evening. I'll just remind you that the, that the third Wednesday, um, this time on the third Wednesday of each month, is the planned date for our future webinars and the program will be um, will be notified soon. We're gonna publish the program on the website as we have it so far. Um, and, and I think that's it. We've uh, 10, 10 to seven, um, we've brought you back 10 minutes to enjoy further on your evening. So I'd just like to say thank you all very much indeed for your time and, and have a lovely rest of your evenings. Thank you all. Thank you.